passage. So turn to James, and um, I, I know that one of the hardest things to do is to um, think through the passage and get a structure in your in your in your mind about how the passage is organized, and then then to be able to put it together. Um, sometimes, as in the case of what uh, the passage Nathan just did, it lays out pretty well to just kind of go, next verse, next verse, next verse, next verse. Um, Mitchell's passage was a lot harder than that. It didn't really, you kind of went through it that way, Mitchell, but that, that was a, uh, wasn't as nearly a, uh, that kind of a passage that lent itself to this point, this point, this point. You kind of had to combine ideas the way that you did. You did it effectively, too. So every passage is different. And what I wanted to do, uh, the reason that uh, I, I uh, chose your second sermon, which we will start uh, a week from tonight. We'll do three and three again. And uh, you have it on your schedule. Uh, and because Donna was last in the schedule, that doesn't affect anything. What we're actually going to do is look at Donna's passage tonight because she won't be preaching. So um, turn to James chapter 3. And you'll notice if you have that assignment, if you don't have that assignment, the problem question that I gave her for James, the last six verses there in James 3, 13 through 18, uh, the uh, problem question was, uh, do you know the children of wisdom? Okay, it's a who question. Who are the children of wisdom? And of course, that's a... Again, it's uh, as you noticed, I don't have any of you had time to look at the passage that I gave you? Yeah. Okay, so uh, James is, uh, I would say, a book for the most part that is pretty straightforward. It's not too difficult. Uh, it's uh, very, very practical. And, and as such, it's a very popular book for many believers because it's such a practical book. Uh, not a lot of deep theological concepts that we need to dig and try to figure out what it means. Pretty straightforward. This is, this is what he's talking about. Except maybe this passage. Um, and um, so, uh, uh, Amanda, would you read 13 through 18 in James chapter 3? Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, and unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed, of, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Okay. <clears throat> You haven't done the background work here, although maybe you've done some of the background work in James. Uh, who in this letter, if you, anybody who's done this work, is James addressing? Jewish so he's, he's addressing believers from a Jewish background, okay? And, and, and probably beyond that, but uh, because he talks about those who are dispersed. And, um, so it's a letter to believers. Do we have any reason to think that he steps back from addressing believers only and addresses non-believers? Or does it seem consistent through the letter in the section that you've looked at that he's addressing the believers only? Just You can only answer for the section you've been reading. Well, for so me, it's, it's, it's believers. It's believers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, with that background then, we would come to this passage and say the same thing. He's talking about believers because when you enter, enter the word at the end of verse 15, demonic, you think to myself, well, are we talking about unsaved people and the wisdom that they bring to life? Or are we still talking about saved? That would be a very inter important interpretive question to nail down because obviously your answer to who's he addressing here will go in two very different directions. If he's only addressing believers, then it's potential that a believer could be living with demonic wisdom. Right? That's the, that's the option that he gives here. Or did we switch back and we go to unbelievers? Okay, that's a very important interpretive question. And so, again, I would encourage you, nail, that's your background work. That's something that your listeners shouldn't have to figure out. You figure that out for them. Okay? So let's just, uh, I, I would agree with what you, most of you said, that this is a book that's written to believers. So that being the case, this passage opens up some very interesting possibilities. Um, 
in terms of, uh, so I pose the question that you don't have on your outline, but uh, do you know who the children of wisdom are? Uh, how many kids does wisdom have according to this passage? Hmm. No two. What? There's only two. Okay? Uh, it is either uh, wisdom that is, according to verse 15, earthly, natural, demonic, or it is, verse 17, wisdom that is from above, that is pure, and then all those other words. It's either not of the Lord, or it is of the Lord. It is the unsaved world's standard of wisdom, or it is the wisdom that comes from God. There's only two wisdom in view here. So, if you were to break this passage down, the major points would be two kinds of wisdom. Two kids, two fruit. In other words, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Show me the pudding and I'll show you where that wisdom came from. So, and that is the way this passage lays out. Um, it starts out right away, verse 14. If you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, arrogant, you lie against the truth, that wisdom is from, it's not from above, it's from below, essentially. That's what he says in verse 15. It's not from above, it's earthly, natural, demonic. You can't get any lower than that. So instead of wisdom that comes down from heaven, it's wisdom that comes up from hell. And, and then where do they meet? They meet in the Christian life. So your, your uh, analysis of the passage would be, we have two kinds of wisdom. Whenever you have a passage, and I think this is true of most of your passages in James, when you have a passage that draws uh, a stark division, uh, two uh, possibilities on a given topic, if it would be unity, disunity, um, earthly wisdom, heavenly wisdom, um, a tongue, I don't know who has the first part of chapter 3, who has the first part of chapter 3? Uh, one, one of you must, I know, has, has yeah, one through. I do. Yeah, okay, so you've got a tongue that divides and causes problem, and you have a tongue that blesses, okay? And in chapter 2, you have a faith that does work and a faith that just talks about it but doesn't do any work at all. Mm -hmm. You have a series of contrasts in this book, all right? Whenever you have two uh, contrasting positions or, or possibilities in addressing a group, it's the... The sharper you can make the contrast between the two groups, the more effective it communicates. And so uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that I did, do you know the children of wisdom, is that they have two different personalities. Again, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm coming up with a little bit of a gimmick though, but I, what I want to do is show people that, you know, you're either this kind of wisdom or that kind of wisdom. They're as different as two kids. All right? In this case, they have the same dad. So if we're, if we're talking about believers, you know, they're children of the Lord. So we're not talking about unbelievers. That's why this is such an important issue to settle up front. Because if you, if you come to your audience, you say, well, we're talking about two possibilities of wisdom that enter into the, the relationships between believers. Wisdom that comes from the pit or wisdom that comes from heaven. And they're very, very different. And that's what the passage is about. So... Um, the way that you would communicate that, you, there's, a, there's a number of ways. So once you kind of get that handle on the passage, who's it speaking to, all right? That's, that's done in your original six questions, right? Who, who's who's the, the author speaking to here? I think he's speaking to believers. What's the issue that he's addressing? Two kinds of wisdom. And so once you kind of sort out through your questions, then you start formulating your statements, and you, then you really draw your central point. And then, um, and you know what? The, the problem question that I gave you a suggestion, go with it. If you want to change it, fine. But I'd like, I'd be sure that if you change it, it, it is a change not just for variety's sake, but actually um, is faithful to the text. The, the questions that I, the question, problem questions that I gave you, I know, I know are faithful to the text because James is that kind of a book. Whereas the, some of the passages you're uh, going through in Ephesians are, are I'd say have a broader range of, of uh, approaches that you could take. Uh, for instance, on the issue of partiality in the first 12 verses in chapter 2, that's really just what it's about. It's about, you know, does a Christian practice fairness? Um, it's pretty difficult to see any other point that's going on there. That, but that, just because it's straightforward, doesn't mean that you don't have a lot of unpacking to do in the passage. 
the, my point in this one is this. When you have a contrast between two possibilities, in this case, two children of wisdom, uh, the sharper you draw that contrast, the better it is for your listeners to see the difference. And the best way, I would say, uh, without going through this passage in detail, if you just notice, uh, he poses a, the question in verse 13. Uh, because he'd been talking to believers, and he says, who among you is wise and understanding? And if you were to imagine you're in a group of 50 people, well, I am. I mean, I read the Bible every day, and, or I've been a Christian for 23 years, or whatever. Notice what he says next. Show by his good behavior and his deeds that he actually possesses wisdom from heaven and not wisdom from hell. Okay? They're going to meet. They meet in the church. They meet one believer to another. They meet in the context of relationships. Notice what he says though. And, and this is the question, what's the fruit? Verse 14, if you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, don't be arrogant, don't lie against the truth. That wisdom that, in, that is, is displayed by verse 14 is, <laughs> it doesn't come from above, but instead, and then he basically describes that it comes from below. And the words earthly, natural, and demonic, if I were doing this passage, those would be key words that I would focus in on. They're, they don't communicate a lot. Demonic does, but earthly and natural don't communicate a lot. You would know, have to know the context for those words and be sure that you communicate them well. All right? Because, again, you're drawing a very sharp contrast. The sharper the contrast you buy, because if you muddy the water, then, then your audience goes away going, yeah, Okay, I don't know. I must be somewhere in the middle. No, you can't be in the middle on this issue. You either got the wisdom from God or you get the wisdom from Satan. You're not. It's one or the other. And the way, the way you know is the fruit. It's the fruit. Okay? Notice how he keeps going on. Verse 16, again. For where jealousy and selfish ambition disorder in every evil thing. Well, when you describe it like that, it's pretty straightforward. That's wisdom from hell. But, those key words, verse 17, but... You know, change your direction. If you, if you have one of those key words in your passage, don't miss it. But, but the wisdom from above. And then we have a very, very different set of descriptors for heavenly wisdom. Pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits. And who seed the fruit, whose fruit is righteousness and sown in peace by those who make peace. Uh, obviously dwells on peace a lot would be a key component of heavenly wisdom, is being a peacemaker. What would be the most effective way, just off the top of your head, I know you haven't had time to, to study this, but I'm just trying to give you some, some hints. If you're drawing a very sharp contrast for people on something like wisdom, what, what would be some effective ways that you might communicate this with people? Anyone? State them side by side. Almost. Okay. So, um, you know, the one, one op, two options, just try sticking them right next to each other. Do you want this or that, or are you this, or do you know that, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, um, so if you have, uh, here's heavenly and here's demonic. Those are strong words. Mm -hmm. We're all comfortable with this word. None of us are comfortable with this word. And that's why you would have to do your work early because if you tell a Christian, you can be, uh, it is possible, according to God's word, for you to have wisdom that is from the pit of hell. Oh, I can't do that. I have the Holy Spirit living in me. No, actually, you can. Mm -hmm. You can have wisdom that's from the pit of hell. I don't believe that. I know that when I was born again, Holy Spirit lives in me. I'm a temple of the Holy Ghost. I can't have wisdom from the pit. Well, you, 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 so you have to be pretty really convincing, if that's what you think the passage says, to make that point. All right? So... We could uh, contrast these two ideas here, and they're all listed. You know, we, we have a, a number of descriptors for each one. What would be an effective way, though, to make that much more personable and to help people identify where they are on the, either the heavenly or the demonic wisdom in their life right now? Story. Story. Exactly. This is where you would have to do some work. The best illustration would be drawn from your own life. And uh, this, would be, this would require some transparency. To think of a time in your life where the wisdom, your behavior, your 
um, what you brought to a relationship really was from the pit. That would be, that'd be very vulnerable to do that, but incredibly effective. What would be one step removed from that, and I, I think you're right on, Mitchell, is to describe a scenario. Uh, who's got two, th two, one through 12? Uh, chapter two. Mitchell, you have it, okay. Um, uh, actually, most of the passages in James are so practical. One of the things that you might consider with a, a, a book, the book of James is to describe a scenario. Think it through. And, and don't just do it quick, but think through a scenario where the, the very tension that is presented in the passage that you have, uh, a doer of the word or a hearer of the word only. Let's take an issue like, and then describe some kind of a scenario with two people coming to that scenario, and one's the doer and one's the hearer. What does that look like? How does it play out? Because what people do is they identify with one character or another in a story. And that's why stories can be very effective. So it's an illustration. Remember, illustrations was something we haven't spent much time on here. But some of you are doing wonderful illustrations in your messages. You are. But an illustration, not so much of you know, an article or, in your case, effective statistics, but an illustration to demonstrate this contrast between these two kinds of wisdom or whatever it might be in the passage that you have. In other words, think of a scenario. It can either be a real scenario from your own life or someone else. You have to be very careful when you use illustrations. Uh, I've said to Linda uh, more than once, w there, there's a, a great blessing and a downside to being in the same church for 23 years. Uh, I have a tremendous wealth of, of stories that I can't tell. Because <laughs> those people are sitting right there. And I have to be very careful with that. Now, your pastor, <laughs> he can tell you stories from other churches, true stories, but he's not stepping on anybody's toes because you don't know those people. And, you know, the names are changed to protect the guilty. <laughs> but, uh, so, be careful about the story that you tell. But, uh, one, one of the, uh, a very effective way, especially when you have a high contrast kind of a presentation in your message, as this would be. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Two kinds of wisdom. What would it look like in a, and then describe a situation. Describe a situation between two believers. Again, if that's, you're convinced that it's two believers, we're not talking about you know, your unsaved co-worker who does drugs on the side and you know, cheats and steals. We're talking about someone else who has a relationship with Jesus Christ and you. And, or you could make it two people if it's too, too uh, personal to have you in the story. You could just make a scenario up between two people, describe a situation, and take these set of qualities and actually portray them in the story and let your audience hear and see with their imagination exactly what it would look like. It can be very effective, but you have to actually spend some time thinking about it. Um, the same thing with uh, partiality. You know, we don't, in our churches, you know, the scenario that James uses in the first 12 verses of chapter 2, where you, you know, you bring in the wealthy guy and you say, you can have the nice seat here and we'll, we'll move the, the slob to the back row. Well, in our church, everybody wants to sit in the back row. So that, that kind of picture doesn't really play well. You would have to think of a modern day illustration, if you were going to use this technique, of showing favoritism in a positive way and negative favoritism on the flip side of it to, to let people see how it works. And so, in a very practical book like James, draw me a picture. Tell me a story. Show me how this works. You would have to have done your work. You, so, what we're doing is we're taking the text now. We understand it. We, we see clearly the contrast that the author has put down here. What does it look like? Because otherwise, you just kind of give them a theoretical kind of a, you know, well, there's, there's demonic wisdom and you don't want to go there and there's godly wisdom you really want to go there well, that makes a lot of sense to me but they don't really have a handle on it yet because you haven't showed them how it works and there's the the this ought to be natural for you right this is telling a story uh -huh. yeah so um it can be very very effective not every passage lends itself to this but in in two uh, a contrast kind of passage which I think most of you have kind of a contrast passage. I'm not saying this is the best way to communicate it or the only way to communicate it, but um, I was uh, 
before I knew Donna was going to do it and now not do it, I was trying to prompt whoever got this passage to say, do you know the children of wisdom? She has two kids, and they're really very different. One is, is a stinker, and he causes more problems than you can shake a stick at, and the other one is a peacemaker. And then you do the illustration to the text, and then you tell your story, see, let people see how the text goes, and then you challenge them to look at their own lives. Which one of these kids would wisdom as a parent call you? Are you the stinker? Demonic, earthly, um, bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, disorder, all kinds of problems in relationships? Or are you peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits? Which are very, very, it parallels the Ephesians 5 passage, I mean Galatians 5 passage, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Different in some, but it parallels the, the thing. But, you know, just saying those terms, and if I were to just to define those terms, you would know intellectually, you know, heavenly wisdom, and demonic wisdom, but when you personalize it, when you, as Mitchell suggested, tell a story, then all of a sudden it comes alive, and then people go, some are going to go, I can't believe how often I'm the devil's child when it comes to wisdom. And that's, that's, a, that's a rude awakening, but I don't think if you just define terms that people are going to get that, because when you introduce the word demonic, it's like, well, it can't be me. I don't listen to the devil. Well, we won't go into whether or not you listen to the devil. Let's just look at fruit. Let's take a scenario. Let's describe two approaches to one. And this one is from the devil. You don't need to get into the theological. And I don't think any of your passages introduce demonic as an issue. And this one's pretty dramatic. Does everyone get what I'm talking about? Any suggestions or comments or questions about that? Right? It can be very effective. Not every passage in, in Scripture lends itself to it, but illustrations that s drive home the point in a way that makes people look at their own lives can be very, very effective. It actually can be the most effective part of your whole uh, presentation because all of a sudden they see themselves in the illustration or they see what the concept is or the principle that you're teaching. And it's like one of those, aha, I get it. Okay, let's pray. Father, we just thank you that uh, for um, uh, Mitchell and uh, Karen and Nathan, Lord, just how you worked through them tonight. And Lord, we were blessed. And uh, we know, Lord, that uh, we had the opportunity to hear from their hearts as they shared your word with us. And Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for uh, how you... Uh, took them through that passage and we saw how they wrestled with it and then were able to share with us um, some of the, uh, how it rubbed off on them, Lord, and it rubbed off on us. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, and I just pray that for the weekend ahead, Lord, uh, that you would uh, give opportunity and focus to uh, work on this next sermon, Lord, and uh, kind of the last thing that we have going on this uh, quarter. And Lord, that the weekend ahead would uh, just be profitable, Lord. Help us to finish up the rest of the assignments and to get everything done in a timely way. And, and Lord, we just thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word, living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, help us to be those who, uh, who wield that sword in an effective way as we prepare this next series of sermons. We just thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen.